uh, well, uh, the first door that is best called is the landscape as a cultural representation, in the sense, landscape as an image. It stems directly from the, our painting, oh, sorry, our landscape was originally envisioned as something that stems from painting a pictorial reality, um, that stems also as, as a scene. So the idea of senses are, here are quietly, are quite connected. The second, and this door can relate quite well in archaeology, uh, any given territory produced and transformed by human societies throughout history. Actually, if you look at the um, etymology of the word Landschaft in German, and even landscape in English, we can see that, uh, at least in German, I think it's simpler to, to, to vision it this way, uh, we have Land, which is literally land, and we have Schaft, which comes from the old German Schaft, uh, Schaftler, yeah, I think so, which means something, uh, a thing that is made. Uh, and Schaft, the, the, the modern German Schaffen, comes from this exact same root. So a Landschaft, a landscape, is literally a produced land. Um, the third is a complex system between natural and cultural elements. Again, in archaeology, we can quite see the echoes of this. The fourth uh, is a space of sensible experiences. And here we are entering in the ideas of landscape, which are so far wide that we can absolutely can use it as with everything that we want to. Uh, although there are some, I do believe, some theoretical problems with the fourth and the fifth definitions of landscape, at least these five groups, which renders it quite useless, in my opinion. And fifth, as a synonym of place or any given context, or, in a way, as a literary resource, but basically, we're just sort of saying landscape because it is a fancy word. But moving on. The sheer diversity offered by the multiple theoretical frameworks of philosophy of the landscape makes it possible to find compatible theoretical basis in the favor of existence of the existence of literary landscapes. Again, since they are so vast, we can basically apply what we want to. If you take if we quick quickly take into account this group, we re groups, we realize that in the case of literature, the question is not if landscape is to be considered a complex system between natural and cultural elements. Instead, it has to be framed in the terms of the relationship between landscapes and textual realities. And again, this brings us to the close relationship between pre perception and vision and the apprehension of the sensible world in its impressions and representations. If you consider there can be no landscape without perception and the natural aesthetical judgment that arises thereof necessarily, or the use of the senses, any further discussion is future. If we do not envision this, hardly we can argue in favor of a literary landscape. Literal landscapes as a general space only turns into a synonym of the latter with no real consequences. Another nece uh, definition necessitates a link between the senses and the aesthetics, rendering fundamental to further enlighten us in this question. Verily, in literature one does not see the shape of the horizon, does not hear the sounds of the world, nor smell the sense of the environment, and not touch the, its materialities. The reading of space is limited to re uh, sorry, the understanding of space is limited to reading and the Kantian faculty of imagination in all its creative and articulative properties. Being landscape mostly an aesthetic judgment or even an aesthetical feeling of nature, an aesthetic and a feeling that arises from the senses that preempt the world, there is no such thing as a literary landscapes, for it has no central basis. Again, if our discussion steps a little further into aesthetics, we can see that landscapes need a sensible presence, what Martin Zeller called a Gegenwart, which literature does not offer. It can only be made accessible through its appearance, a shine. Only the aesthetical, any aesthetical object can only be so if it appears, it gives itself to the senses. And being perception of fundamental and classical, even in Baumgarten or Kant, characteristic of all aesthetic objects. The aesthetic object, which we are talking about is a unique form of perception, and perception are interdependent concepts. In another light, one of the basic conditions of aesthetic fruition is non-confusion between the represented with reality, and from there, being able to distinguish the simulated as simulated, that is, an element in the midst of others of appearance, but never a single component. Literature, stemming, stemming from a non-sensitive basis, does not offer this. There is also no difference between the simulated and the real in the red descriptions. Furthermore, space in literature, let alone landscapes, does not even qualify as space in itself, for they lack the difference between the plane where the imagetic course takes place and the concrete real where the spectator's part is located. In this view, we cannot even talk about virtual landscapes, 3 digital landscapes. They don't exist since there again, there's no difference. Uh, we cannot envision such difference. But, to f <coughs> terribly sorry for what happened, technical problem. Um, 
<laughs> Finally, uh, tell us of this. Um, oh, this was all planned, believe me. Uh, <laughs> well, but to, to fight this idea, and because I, we do believe that there is some theoretical conundrum associated with this view, um, we turn to a Deleuzean framework. In a sense, and since Deleuze is the philosopher of immanence, we must take into account that the plane of immanence, which is the fundamental grounding concept that we have here, is formulated as the horizon from which thinking as such can take place, and thus constitutes the internal condition of thinking. It is, therefore, the absolute ground of philosophy, its earth or deterioration, the foundation on which it creates its concepts. All ideas happen at this level. We cannot envision anything without a plane of, con of, of immanence, which, in a way, we can call it consciousness. Stemming from the idea of the plane of immanence, the concept of virtuality permeates the entirety of a plane of immanence. Only virtuality is populated plane. The virtual is given consistency and arrayed as real, in that it captures what secures beings to their being. The fact that I'm seeing all of you, the fact that I, am, I do believe that you are real, I hope I'm not hallucinating at least, uh, this is a virtuality. Even if I am hallucinating for a moment, you exist. That hallucination exists. This is a virtuality. We are all virtualities in our plane of immanence. All of this is of surmount importance to ascertain the existence of literary landscapes. The plane of immanence dissolves the difference between the text and what derives from the sensible world. For again, they are all but uh, virtualities. The power of the false institutes a separation between time and truth that renders the distinction between what is false and the truth and true a frivolous one, wherein the relationship between the real and the virtual appears an in indiscernibility of the two, a perpetual exchange. Thus, we argue that an archaeology, an archaeology of literary landscapes, thus, since we have concluded that literary landscapes is a theoretical possibility, is possible through deconstruction, which we do believe that it is the element that allows for an archaeological approach to take place. Any archaeological endeavor requires destruction, uh, sorry, <laughs> deconstruction, not destruction, beforehand. Um, literary landscapes can thus be subsumed as a text or discourse, or description of space mediated through an aesthetical feeling of nature and the aesthetic qualities of writing, the materialization of language that arrives from the contemplation of any given virtuality in the plane of immanence. So to render the literary landscape archaeologically approachable, we break it down to three vectors of analysis. To establish one object of study, how can we actually approach them? Divided into three vectors. The first one deals with the theoretical basis, the conceptual, present in any given work of literature. By this, we do not mean to dwell in what the author intended or meant. Instead, this group is dedicated to the inquiry of the funding of the multiple fundamental grounding concepts that create and allow for the existence of a landscape in a narrative. Three fundamental vectors inside this group become essential to understand the literary landscape. The idea of landscape itself, naturally. The concept and sense of nature, since um, in the history of philosophy, oddly, we can envision landscape without nature, at least without, not without incurring the same theoretical conundra, and the characteristics and sense of aesthetics. If we define landscape as a aesthetical feeling of nature, for instance, we do need to know what the idea of aesthetics present in the text is. The second group seeks to understand how material realities are described, as well as its position, in importance and role in the construction and perception of a literary landscape. If the question of technique, and in all Heideggerian sense here intended, is fundamental to understand interactions between humans and between humans and the environments, it only stands that the analysis of literary landscapes necessitates the descriptions of such entities, the relationship between men, mankind, and nature and the environment. Now, this can um, point to landscape. Well, the last group is focused in understanding the relationship between landscape and the narrative. Our literary landscape affects and molds the narrative. To give a quick example, uh, and obviously, Due to time, natural time constraints, we won't do a, a full out analysis of Man in the Air Castle, but we'll give some hints on how this can be done. Um, Philip K. Dick's Man in the Air Castle this is basically a dystopia in which the axis is the victor of the Second World War. The world is then divided into two great blocks Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. Um, and it is set, uh, to, it, set it in 1962. Most of the narrative, actually, the entirety of the narrative uh, is passed in America. Uh, that has been divided into two. Um, again, as I said, the Pacific West states, the Japanese, and the Greater Nazi Reich in the in right. Uh, the block that you see there is basically the end of the book. I don't, oh, I don't want to spoil anyone. Um, but yeah, basically, I think, travel occupations. And we'll basically 
Uh, we'll have some quotes of the book, naturally, and we'll comment. While the Germans were busy bustling in uh, enormous robot construction systems across space, the Japs were still burning off the jungles in the interior of Brazil, erecting I, I, uh, eighth or clay apartments houses for the ex hunters. By the time the Japs got their first spaceship off the ground, the Germans would have the entire solar system sued up tight. Back in the quaint old history book days, the Germans had missed out while the rest of Europe put nail trend touches the colonial empires. However, Frank reflected, you're not going to be the last this time. It learns. And he thought about Africa, the Nazi experiment there, and his blood stopped in his veins, hesitated. The last went on, that huge, empty room. Maybe even the master architects in Berlin do not know. Bunch of, of automatons, building and toiling away. Building, winding down. The first instances of this is constructive exercise. We encounter two reflections made by, made by Frank Frick, a character that the reader follows in the narrative, in his struggles and thoughts about the Nazi system and what they basically brought upon the world. There are here unveiled several elements that lay the foundation for the idea of landscape in Dick's Nazi Germany. Deconstructing them allows us to find two major key points. Deconstruction, sorry, uh, destruction of the impurities and reconstruction from nothingness. Africa was completely destroyed and erased in the book. The robotic workforce employed by the Nazi is utilized for infrastructure and manufacture. However, their abilities are not exclusive to those activities, as their potential for destruction is employed in the whole country. Africa, sorry, continent. Even as the Nazis' ethnic views, Africa became a huge empty ruin, as the robots did not build, but grind it. His violent remarks in Dick's writings demonstrate a step, a necessary step, formulation of the Nazi landscape, or at least the idea of a landscape in the Nazi, in the Nazi mind. First, it is mandatory to cleanse the site. Africa becomes a gigantic ruin, devoid of anything, because it did not have anything to offer for the Nazi, for the Nazi vision. The, quite on the contrary. The whole continent became a landscape of the void, a major reduction of a multi sensible experience. In fact, we can even argue that this step of Nazi landscape is the anti-landscape, anything that is not within the boundaries of the acceptable of the former. It does not mean that there isn't an aesthetical judgment, as there is beauty on the Nazi's eyes, on the grinding, cleansing, and obliteration of what is considered impure. This... Again, sorry. why is this still happening? Um, again, uh, the aesthetical experience of the Nazi landscape is only possible by the destruction of the aesthetical experience of Vienna. What is that enormous structure below? Lutze asked. It is half niched, open at one side. A spaceport? The Nipponese have no spacecraft, I thought. With a smile, Baini said, That's the Golden Puppy Stadium. The baseball park, Lutze left. Yes, still have baseball. Incredible. They have begun to work a great structure for a past. For the past time, an idle time, wasting sport. Interrupting, Benny said, it is finished. That is permanent shape. Open on one side, a new architectural design. They're very proud of it, it looks. Lutz said, gazing down, as if it was a giant designed by a Jew. Benny regarded the man for a time. He felt strongly for a moment the unbalanced quality, the psychotic streak in the German mind. Did Lutz actually mean what he said? Was it truly a spontaneous remark? In another passage, the character Lutze represents the most extremist views of the Nazi party, the psychotic streak when discussing the recent monument that the Americans built, the Golden Puppet Stadium. Not only its function resembles a waste of time, not only does it not, does it encompass its cultural views, but its architectural nature raises some question. Uh, but as Baini explains its nature, Lutze dismisses its efforts, resulting in the final observation designed by a Jew. Behind the obvious insult lies the same idea present in the destruction of Africa. Incompletedness and functional incompatibility are not acceptable. The possibility of a control of a cultural remark, or even a landscape with elements that resemble anything but the Nazi ideals, is a futile and irrelevant enterprise. Suppose, eventually they, the Nazis, destroy it all, leave it as sterile ash. They could. They have the hydrogen bomb. And no doubt they would. Their thinking tends towards the gute Dämmerung. They may well crave it. They are actively seeking it. Find a holocaust for everyone. And what will that leave, that third world insanity? Will that put an end to all life, of every kind, everywhere, when our planet becomes a dead planet by all ends? This is epithemized by Captain Rudolf Wegener when reflecting upon the, uh, an eventual final act, the ascension to a good demo, the last anti-landscape, being so strong and psychotic that it could not contain in itself. Again, this idea of anti-landscape and the imposition of what the, masters, the master architect in Berlin proposed. Turning our gaze to Japan, uh, we will see that the reality is quite different. Through the eye doors of the Nippon <coughs> Time building, men and women hurried, all of them well-dressed. Their voices reached Childan's ears, and they started into motion. A glazer pops, 
uh, aports of the towering Edis, the highest building in San Francisco, wall of offices, windows, the fabulous design of the Japanese architects, and the surrounding garden of the dwarf evergreens, rocks, the current sensory landscape, sand imitating a dried up stream, winding past roots among simple, irregular stones. On the other hand, in Imperial Japan territories, the tra traditional architecture blends with nature. The current sensory landscape, the only actual mention of the notion of landscape in the entire book, represents this fusion as the organization of gardens, paths, and geological units is in tune with the buildings. The Zen element, tranquility, and spirituality is then the motto for the landscape, an aesthetic junction with nature on its basis. The hands of the artificer, Paul said, at war, which basically beauty and allowed for that war to flow into this piece. Possibly himself knows only that this piece satisfies. It is complete to war. By contemplating it, we gain more war ourselves. We experience the tranquility associated not with art, but with only things. I recall a shrine in Hiroshima, where a shin bone of some medieval saint could be examined. However, this is an artifact that, has a, that was a relic. This is live in the now, whereas that merely remains. By this meditation, conducted by myself at a great length since you were last year, I have come to identify the value in which as in opposition to historicity, I am deeply moved, as you may see. This distinction between artifacts and relics, art and the old, is of particular significance when debating the imperial Japan that is completely different from Nazi Germany. The feeling of satisfaction, meditation, tranquility is the core of the materialities and, for consequence, the architecture and the current sensual lands that is envisioned by all of this. Uh, this is last slide. Um, tasteful in the extreme and so aesthetic, few pieces, a lamp here, a table, a bookcase, print on the wall. The incredible Japanese sense of wabi could not be thought in English. The ability to find in simple objects a beauty beyond that of that is of elaborate or ornate, something to do with arrangement. It's final, very interesting this idea of arrangement and in aesthetics, we call basically a stimmung, which is basically a disposition that constitutes the aesthetical identity of things. Um, again, in Imperial Japan, we find it quite more than in Nazi Germany. The idea of arrangement denotes a logic between objects, which, from an archaeological standpoint, opens a new horizon for researching. These kinds of landscapes, the wabi, the simplicity, correlates with the current sensu, with a landscape that has logic, but it is made to be enjoyed, that is simple in its presentation, but denotes emotion, emotional and spiritual complexity. All this is visible in the text, with the Imperial Japan representing a constructive, constructive view of landscape, while the Nazi Germany depicts the epitome of destruction. To finish, um, since we have established that literary landscapes are a theoretical possibility, that we can archaeologically approach them, uh, we do hope that the future sees more of this relationship between literature and textual realities and archaeological ones. And citing one of my favorite artists, Lixa Bargeld, when he sang about that is Alice Wieder often, everything is open again. I do hope that in the future we see more of this and truly all is open again. Thank you very much.